Theranos. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Good. Oh, just just great. Very nice to to meet you. What are some of the uh, fo like the, the focus areas of your research in morphology? So, pretty much from the beginning, I've been interested in um, what we call morphological productivity, which has to do uh, with with the fact that you can make up new words and that uh, I, I, if a speaker, a listener of the language will be able to recognize those words. So normally when we think of language, we think, well, the language has some fixed set of words. And then you take those words and you put them into sentences. Um, but in fact, um, that's not true. I mean, there is, there's always some fixed set that you know. And of course, the more frequent or common the word is, the more likely you are to know it. But um, where well, there's often a need for a new word, and when that happens, usually you can just sort of automatically um, make up a new word without, without thinking about it, and somebody else will understand that. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, has always been the, the kind of central problem, is how do people make up new words, how do people recognize new words, and the fact that some new words are more recognizable than others. Um, and so I'm very interested in trying to figure out, well, how can I, you know, what methods can I use to, to verify these ideas? And over the years, one of the big, I think, most, most interesting things for me has been that there's, we have all kinds of methods for doing this. Um, so we have computational methods, uh, and we have um, experimental methods. Um, so I, I'll just I'll think of a word. So um, I take a stapler. So I have a stapler here, right? That I found on my desk. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to use, you know, I want to do something with a stapler. So we have the word staplerize. Somebody could make up that word. You know, I'm going to staplerize it. Mm -hmm. And, or somebody might say, well, I'm going to staplerify it. <laughs> right. If you ask me, just, if you just ask me my intuitions about this, I would say, well, yeah, I might, so, somebody might say staplerize, but somebody's not likely to say staplerify. Mm -hmm. right? It seems odd. Staplerify just seems odd. And so the question is, well, is that true? Um, and we have a couple of sort of, a couple of ways that we could actually find out if it's true. So a simple way is I could just go on Google or any kind of, you know, web search engine, and I could just type in staplerize. And I could see, you know, is this a word that has been used before? Or I can use, I could do the same with staplerify. If I looked up both of those words on the internet, I would find that, yeah, it turns out people have used staplerize. But staplerify is probably either not there or has a very, very low count. Now, when you started and uh, up until today, then, d tell me a little bit about the progression of uh, maybe the, either the methods you used or the, the focuses that, that, you know, throughout the time of your research. Sure. So one of the things that, that I did very early on, um, it turns out that there are what we call reverse alphabetical dictionaries. Oh. And which are basically, it's just, it's, it's a, a, dic, a, a word list, um, but instead of being alphabetized from the front, it's alphabetized from the back mm -hmm. of the word, right? So yeah. the, the first word would be words, a word that ends in A, and then a word that ends in AA, and then BA, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last words are not words that begin with Z, but that end in Z, right? And so there's a, it turns out there's a dictionary like that. It's called Walker's Rhyming Dictionary. And it was supposed to be used by poets. Mm -hmm. And it was first published about, oh, in the, in the late 1700s. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started doing this work with that little dictionary and say, okay, how many words are there that end in eyes? And how many words are there that end in if I? And we would do this fairly simple sort of counting exercise. And in fact, um, people still use that kind of as a very rough tool. Um, and then I started doing very early on um, what we call lexical decision tasks, where you would simply ask 
a, a what we now call a participant. You would set up a very, very simple experiment in which you would ask somebody, well, is this a word? And we could do this with various kinds of words and we would get interesting answers to that. And then you would time these lexical decision tasks and, and ask, um, well, how long does it take somebody to tell you? Actually, what we're interested in most is how long does it take somebody to tell you that something isn't a word? So, and now, of course, we have much fancier tools mm -hmm. that we can use to ask that sort of, those sorts of questions. Wow. The other tool that I use a lot um, is the Oxford English Dictionary online, um, mm -hmm. which is, is this wonderful, wonderful resource. What we use that for is, is if you're interested in, well, do people, when did people start using words of this kind, right? In other words, when did people start using words that end in eyes? Because eyes comes, it comes from Greek, actually. Hmm. And it comes from Greek through Latin and French. It's not an English suffix, but we use it now all the time. So mm -hmm. you can uh, look at just, that, again, with using uh, many, many words, and we can ask ourselves, all right, when did people start using this suffix? When did people start using that suffix? Um, when did, and, and did things become more popular, less popular, those sorts of things. What, what, what were some of the key advances that um, you've seen, like the, the major accomplishments or the key advances that you've seen, uh, both in your research and, and over the period of time that you've been a researcher in terms of um, you know, our understanding of, of morphology? Sure, I think, um, well, as, as with many scientific questions, the, the main thing that you learn is that it's much more complicated than you thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Everything so, else is. <laughs> uh, I think that's the, what we've learned is with, with anything that, that humans do um, is that we understand the more we understand it the more complicated it gets um, there is no real whatever people are doing and I think we have a better idea of what they're doing um, it's it's not simple the other thing that really I think we've come to understand is that people's internal knowledge of language is is incredibly rich they're not conscious of it but they really they know sort of what the the the, the frequency or the strength each individual word is that's in their head depending on on what circumstances that sort of linguistic and cultural they will use different words and use them in different ways um, but a nice example that i can think of is um so, you know, we have these two suffixes in English, which are ick and ickle. And, um, and sometimes, uh, it, it, sometimes you can only use one, but sometimes uh, you can use either one. So, for example, um, I can say either logistic or logistical, and either one of them seems okay. It turns out that in some cases, this is actually different groups of people who use different suffixes. So the, the one that I like best is um, that for whatever reason, doctors under circumstance, certain circumstances love ick, where other people don't. Um, so for example, doctors will say things like psychologic or biologic, whereas everybody else is gonna say psychological or biological. And, and that's, I've, we've actually demonstrated that I mean, with statistically with pretty good accuracy. And it's, it's sort of like, well, you have these little groups, right? These kind of little social groups and each social group has its own way of using the language. Hmm. Uh, so they're using the language to kind of signal uh, where they stand in, in a, in in, in the social structure. It's, it's interesting, you know, because um, uh, part of your um, uh, research, I, I, I believe, or part of your activities is, is the use of sign language. And I, yes. I understand that you've, yes. you've been, um, you know, doing work in that, that area. So is it, tell, us, uh, tell, tell us a little, tell me a little bit more about your sign language work. Oh, sure, sign language. language. Yeah. Uh, no, that's been, that's been amazing. I had a conversation with a colleague, a uh, long conversation. Um, 
uh, and she uh, tried to convince me that sign language was, that there was interesting morphology in sign language. And um, so we started working together and now we've been working, the two of us have been working together for, it's, it's actually over 20 years. And then uh, we were privileged to be joined by two other, two other women, um, one of whom unfortunately passed away a few months ago. Um, but we were, uh, you know, a team of four people. Uh, and one of them actually happens to be deaf. Uh, she's a, uh, the only deaf person to have ever uh, won a MacArthur Award, which are these awards, these so-called genius awards. And um, about 15 years ago, we stumbled on this sign language that's used in a Bedouin village in Israel. Oh, wow. uh, one of two of our colleagues happened to be in Israel, and one of them was asked to be on a committee of an anthropologist who was working in this village. And so, what we learned uh, was that there was that in in this village, a a sign language had emerged. Uh, without any outside influence of any sort. I mean, what had happened was that um, because of the marriage patterns in the village, there's a, there's a tendency for uh, recessive genetic anomalies to take hold. So it's about 80 years ago, four deaf siblings were born into a single family in this village. And um, so we now know, and in part because of this research, that that people have such a drive to communicate that even if you have a very small number of people, they will create a language when they have none. Um, so this is the smallest number that anybody's ever seen is four, but I suspect if you had two, it same thing would happen. As long as people can, because people just need to share. They just need to, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a very, very basic human instinct that, you know, people, need to share their feelings, their observations, whatever. So these four deaf siblings created a language. We never met any of those four people because they had passed away, but we've been working with, with their, the, the next generation and the next and the next. So we've now been working with, with three generations. And what we do, what, we, what we've seen is we've seen how this sign language actually emerges. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a natural experiment and one, of course, that you couldn't do, you, you couldn't like simply take four children and lock them in a room without any language input. Um, and so we've really learned some amazing things about how, pe how a language kind of comes into being. Hmm. Interesting. And it, it starts off very, very simple, just kind of individual words. And then, um, and the words are isolated from one another. They don't have much connection with each other. And then the, the, uh, the system gradually emerges over time. So yeah, that's, that's, that's been, and they even have morphology. They don't have much, but they have a little bit of structure inside those words. So your future research is taking the new technologies that are, and, and what they're able to do now to further deepen our understanding of how words are formed and, how, and where, where the formation right. come from and how we connect our psychology uh, to the words. Right. right, exactly. Would your research also look at the impact of perhaps how these forms of artificial intelligence or how these technological innovations will change our understanding of, of words, will uh, have a different impact than, let's say, from you know, the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, that kind of thing? 15 years ago, people said, writing is dead. Nobody's going to write anymore because everybody's going to have a telephone, right? And guess what? Everybody has a telephone, but... Um, I know when, when I communicate with, with my children who were in their thirties, I mean, they're not, you know, we're not talking teenagers. Everybody's texting. That's what everybody's doing. So in fact, we're using these telephones that we thought we were going to be speaking on and we're using them to write. It turns out that this technology that we thought was going to destroy the written language is actually enriching the written language. And I, I have colleagues who study individual, uh, these online communities um, who use, they're making up words constantly. 
and they're making up words that only they can use. We'd like to have you share your insights from your research okay. and, and from the field as well. What advice would you offer junior colleagues and, and young researchers uh, uh, and students, uh, you know, starting out in the field? So my, you know, my graduate students, my younger colleagues, their knowledge of technical methods and um, statistics, uh, computer programming are much, much deeper than mine. And in fact, for me, one of the great joys when I work with, with graduate students and younger colleagues is I'll come up with a question and I'll say, so, so how do you think you could like look at this question? And, and they will, you know, they'll come back in 20 minutes and say, well, look, I've written this program in Java or whatever, um, or R or and whatever computer language they're using. And look, now we can take this program and we can look at this set of, and understand it much better. Um, so I find that the successful academics of the future are really going to have the much greater skills, these empirical methods than what we have today. Okay. Um, and all kinds of new machinery. I mean, we're now using um, ERP signals, which is basically brain signals, uh, to get at what's going on. Right. Uh, we're using eye trackers. I mean, there's all kinds of devices. Uh, but, but you still need old guys to sort of say, say okay, Yes, you have all these fancy devices, but what are you trying to find out, right? <laughs> you just throwing, you can't just throw these fancy devices at things. You have to actually know what you are looking for. Right. Uh, How have your values um, as, as a researcher changed over time? Yeah, I, well, I think for me at least, what, what counts as, as language is, is really changed in terms of what sorts of, I think, consciously or unconsciously, people used to sort of, let's say if you're looking at English um, or any language, French, people would have very kind of fairly traditional ideas about what counts as English, right? Uh, or even what counts as a language. And I think that's definitely broadened over time. Um, so in my sign language research, I've had people come to me and say, well, that sign language that these people use in the village, that's not really a language, is it? And, and I've, I've really kind of grown away from that. Um, and uh, I think uh, I've learned from, from uh, my colleagues who really are sort of basically looking at all different kinds of, of linguistic communication. Um, and so I think I've become less rigid in my views of what counts as a language. Um, if I can give you an anecdote, there's, there was a very, a, a tool that, that people relied on for many, many years um, was um, something called the Brown Corpus, which was a corpus of about a million words that was collected in the early 1960s. And the people who collected that went out of their way to not have anything in that corpus that resembled natural speech. They said, we're not going to have any, any uh, drama. We'll only have like written literature. Huh. And, and people use that, that their results for, they're still using them today. But when you think about it, that's not representative of language, of the English language at all, right? I mean, what people write in newspapers and books is a very sort of small fraction of what the language actually does. So for me, that's been important, is just sort of widening the view of what counts as, uh, as language. The research that you and, your, and, and others in your field have conducted over the years, how has that, um, how has, has that impacted people's lives? I can actually point to, uh, to one person whose name was William Stokey, it's spelled S-T-O-K-O-E, who was, um, he was actually teaching Chaucer to deaf people mm. in, um, in a place called Gallaudet University in, in Washington. And he was the first person to say, I think that because everybody wanted, they thought that deaf people had to speak, right? 
that that's the only way they could really function in society was by speaking. And he said, I think these people are doing something with their hands that really is a language. And he proved that that was true and showed that their sign language was, in fact, he was the person who gave the name American Sign Language. He, that was, he gave that name to, to what they were doing. And what's amazing and what was so beneficial to society was that he convinced people that this was a real language. And so that deaf people were no longer looked down on in the same way. Um, so, I mean, we would say he legitimized sign language. And we've done a little bit of that in our work where the people in the village, they didn't even think they had a language. Hmm. And so by working with them, we've kind of got them to become, a, to become more proud of their language. The other thing that we've done um, is we've helped with the education system. We've helped the people in this village uh, in terms of their schooling. So we've, uh, whereas previously, they had teachers who were coming in, but the teachers really didn't understand what the language was about at all. So we've helped them in that way. Um, and um, I think in general, uh, that's one of the things that linguists have done is they've gotten people to be, the society at large to be more accepting of, of, of varieties um, and rather than simply saying, well, if you don't speak the standard, then you don't, you know, you're, you're, you're really, you're, you're not very smart. One of the things that I think we've done a little bit is to make people aware of, of that humans do have this, this very rich capacity that we need to appreciate. Okay, right. well, thank you very much, Dr. Aronoff. It was really great meeting you and yes. you in person, yes. almost in person. Okay. And uh, yes. thanks, thanks so much for your insights and your information. We really appreciate right. it. Thank you for the honor. Thank you.